my honor to introduce a good friend and a great advocate. John Linder has represented Gwinnett County and Walton and Barrow for a number of years. He's represented us in this part of the uh, state since 1992, and I'm proud to call him and Lynn good friends. Congressman Linder, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. How's this sound? <laughs> okay. We're going to have a few words just to open it up and then take as many questions as we can get through because we came to hear you tonight. We came to learn from you and listen to your views on this. I'm one who's come to the end of this August recess with the notion that health care is not the reason for everybody's concern. It is, <laughs> it is just the most close and personal and reachable thing to do, express yourself on. Because when I've been all over this district during August, people are concerned about, we own banks? We own car companies? We're spending $787 billion, not on infrastructure. 5% is on infrastructure. Most of that's expanding welfare. Trust me, I'm on that committee. And we think the American people just sat back and said, whoa, this is going too much, too fast. <laughs> and And health care became the easiest thing to personalize and to react to and to talk about. And so we're here to talk about health care tonight and anything else you might want to raise. How do we move this program, 3400, being in the minority? We do it because we talk to people just exactly like you. And you talk to people that you know. And then you go to election polls and you have decisive elections. We've, we do this because we want you to know that we're not ignorant of the problems that should and can be fixed in health care, in my view, starting with legal reform. And those can be fixed without, as Tom said, no costs. But we can't move the agenda in Washington. We don't have any chairman. We trust you to do that. The reason these town hall meetings have been held all across the United States during this month, and you've been reading about them in the tea parties, you've been reading about this on, on tel in the newspapers and on television, the reason this is happening is because you move pe people. You move the Congress way more than I can. And these folks are listening to you. They're listening to you. There are 64 or 5 Democrats in seats that voted for Bush and McCain. They're listening closely. And they can't win without those seats. Now, you're showing up on your own by ones and twos with no pre-printed signs and nobody paying you by the hour to express your views. And you're not only doing it here in North Gwinnett, you're doing it all across the country. Don't stop. That is huge. Now, let me deal with the first question. In 1998, I was in the leadership of our party, and we held a press conference talking about the promises we kept in 1997 and the commitments we were making for 1998. We had 15 t TV cameras in the room. We had 50 reporters in the room. Not one mention ever made it to the press. Hmm. Not one word was ever printed or one film ever shown. <clears throat> in July, 134 of us went to the floor on one day during the one minute period and spoke on jobs and health care and a pretty coordinated statement. It took three and a half hours to get through the one minute period, and the only mention of it was made when they headlined Steny Hoyer, the majority leader, for chastising us, chastising us for taking up too much time. Two weeks later, we went with 140 plus people to the full house to talk about health care. Trust me, we are talking about this all over the country, and if you're not hearing about it, that's not our fault. We're going to, we get our message across on the internet and in groups like this, but the media will ignore us because we're not talking the message. In the 70s, I voted for a program in Georgia called Risk Pooling. Providing a pool for people who have members of their family that get turned down by insurance companies. 
We've never funded it. If you get rid of all the flack about the 46, 47, 50 million people, about a fourth of them are eligible right now for Medicaid and S-CHIP and just haven't bothered to sign up. I don't care about them. About a fourth of them between the ages of 16 and 34 and get very cheap insurance. A significant number live in families that make $75,000 a year. I don't care if they don't want to buy insurance. I care about those six to 10 million people who are being turned down. We should have the federal government, the state government, contribute to the risk pools. It would be a very large pool in 50 states. And we should turn to the insurance companies. I was making this case several years ago to the CEO of a major insurance company. And he said, send me a bill. I'll pay it. I make money in Georgia. We should find a way to fund the risk pools for those six to 10 million people who are chronically uninsured. And for those people who have an opportunity and are just too lazy or cheap to do it, we should let them shift for themselves. Let me go back to the first, one of the first questions about the mandates, the state mandates, and, and buying insurance across state lines. And I participated in this gleefully when I was in the state legislature 30 years ago. We voted to make sure that if you're going to sell insurance in Georgia, you had to include PAPs, uh, pap smears, mammograms, and, and prostate screens. And we thought we were delivering something to our constituents. We were delivering them higher premiums. Each of us owns homeowner's insurance. I pray to God never have to use mine. And if I had to include fixing broken windows and changing light bulbs, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> the notion that politicians know more about this than the doctors and the patients is just yeah. nuts. And my mother, before she died, had to buy a supplemental insurance policy for her Medicare in the state where she had to pay for hair transplants. She didn't want one. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get beyond these mandates. And we need to get beyond politicians' decisions that we can help you and deliver you something. How would you like to have auto insurance that pay for oil changes? This is nuts. Let me add to that. The putting a ceiling on $250,000 on non-economic losses doesn't limit recoveries. Correct. They can get 100% of their costs and their losses through economic damages, loss of earning power, et cetera, any, any health care any healthcare costs. But what the $250,000 cap does is it, it tells the lawyer, you're going to only get about half of that. Is it worth your time? 90 plus percent of the doctors that go to court win in front of a jury. But those things seldom go to court because of the cost it takes to go to court and the insurance company settle and then just add to the bill. In 2003, as Tom suggested, Texas went to a limit on $250,000. Two things occurred. They've lowered their malpractice rates by 27% since then, but doctors have flooded into the state, including into some of the most underserved areas of the state because they can practice real medicine. When doctors give you $10,000 worth of tests to discover that they thought they were right in the first place, you had a migraine, they could fix it with aspirin. They didn't do that to make money. They've got all kinds of people to turn to and treat. They did it because if they're only 95% correct on the migraine, they had to cover 100%, eliminate all the other risks, or they'd be sued. Uh -huh. We think it's 100 to $200 billion a year in medicine, practiced medicine, just to defend themselves. Now, uh, as for the person who said this is not a health care bill, I, I've said that very same thing a dozen times in the last three weeks. This is not about health care. It's not even about jobs. It's about control. But just imagine, we've got a $1.6 billion in the health. The three health bills came from three committees were very similar. They had modest changes. And the Energy and Commerce Committee, because it had eight blue dogs, conservative Democrats on it, accepted more amendments than any of the other committees did. And they'll sort that out. They're doing it this August, by the way. But they were very similar. And can you imagine how important it is to spend $1.6 billion for streetlights and the health care bill? And to spend $9 billion to send a nurse into the home of first-time parents and young parents to teach them how to parent. <laughs> well, that came through my subcommittee. We have $244 billion worth of money available at the state, federal, and local 
level for that very thing today, but the community thinks that other priorities are more important than teaching how to parent your kids, and they're not spending it that way, so the left says, force them to spend it. Uh -huh. This is just control, and you're exactly right. You start with the, uh, this lady back here. What can we, what can you do? Is it too late? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you the president has the right to pick his advisors. And you can call them what you want to call them, um, czars or whatever, but he has a right to pick his top advisors. What worries me more than anything is he's picking people who, makes this, who will make decisions he should be making. Now, we're not surprised at this, folks. I'm going to say that a fourth of you at least voted for this guy. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. He got a significant number of votes from this area, and he told us who he was before he ran. He said, when I went to college, I didn't select the, the same routine friends that you run into. I sought out as friends Marxist professors. He wrote this. Now, do we have time to change it? Curiously, the three bills in the House have a beginning date for taxation purposes in January of 2011, after the next election. And even more curiously, the treatment side of it, how you will join various orga uh, healthcare organizations, doesn't become mandated until January of 2013. <laughs> presidential election. you got lots of time. Tom and I have been talking about agenda here for the last six months. Tom is the chairman of the most conservative, largest group of Republicans in the, in the House. <laughs> we, we have said, just talking to each other, the first thing, the number one platform will be, give us a majority and we will stop the spending. Yes, exactly. Only 10% of the stimulus has been spent. We'll freeze it. And secondly, we'll overturn all of these laws on health care. Well, we need... We need, to have, uh, we need to have another decisive election, and we haven't had one for a long time. I don't care if you call it a public option, or a government option, or co-ops, or cornflakes. It's going to be a government-sponsored enterprise that future politicians and congresses will amend to make it more affordable and more fair. It will drive out of business 1,300 already competing private health companies today. Can you say Fannie Med? Yeah. <laughs> Five to six hundred billion dollars of fraud and abuse in Medicare today. We ought to get it out without any other reason. Exactly right. But what happens in, what happens in real life, uh, 170 billion of this savings is going to come from Medicare Advantage, which people love. It's going to, going to, it's going to destroy the program. It's going, it's going to wipe it out. And the rest is going to, become from, going to come from reducing doctors and, and hospitals' reimbursements, as if they have been reduced enough already. That's the largest pot of money. It's the easiest one to go at. It's just making people less willing to take Medicare patients, less willing to deal with the government. And the Medicare people are going to be like the lady's father back here, standing in line. Thank we've you. Said from, we've said from day one that uh, it needs to be looked. We don't know what the problem is. And the gentleman who started this evening out here told us this has nothing to do with health care. This has to do with control. That's just that simple. So they'll say anything they need to do. Let me, let me deal with the manufacturing jobs and NAFTA. I voted for NAFTA. I voted for every free trade group uh, or bill that came through. I believe that a, the business of a free society is knock down walls, not put them up. In his last speech before leaving as the last British governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton gave a speech in Europe. He said if a spaceship had come to planet Earth in the 15th and 16th century and landed first in the teepee huts of North America to the typhoid-ridden flats of London to the warring clans in Paris and wound up in the Ming Dynasty, they would have concluded that China would lead the world for centuries. They had just invented gunpowder they just invented printing. They had an armada at sea. And then they put up a wall around themselves. And history told a different tale.
China's success has been because they've been taking down that wall. Our failure would be to be putting them up. All of our agreements, NAFTA and other agreements, have been because we have the lowest tariffs in the world. We want to lower theirs so we can sell into that country. NAFTA increased in two years by 1,000% the number of uh, trucks and cars we sold into Latin America, in, into, into, into Mexico. In a free society, the best way to spread free freedom is to tear down walls, not put them up. Uh, the Advantage program is going to go away. It's going to go away because the Democrat leadership has said, I think erroneously, that it's a subsidy to insurance companies. You will recall that just in the last month, they have begun to demonize anybody in the insurance business. And Mrs. Pelosi said they're the villains. So they're going to take away that choice that you have, and they're going to try and offer a different choice. Now, we think that Medicare Advantage is one of the most appreciated health care programs we have in Medicare, and they don't like it, and they're going to eliminate it. Let me start with the, let me start with the lady whose, whose father died. It is easy to say, and I had a doctor and his wife in my office two weeks ago, and his wife said, just stop the bickering and do the right thing. And I said, we have a totally different view as to what the right thing is. We want individual choices. They want government choices. There's no middle ground here as to your two sons. We want them to make these decisions. They're going to be, if we pass this stuff, they're going to be paying bills all their life. I want you to make these decisions because if you make a bad decision, it only hurts you. If we make it, it hurts 300 million people. And we want these decisions to be made as locally as possible. As to whether we should abide by the laws, under the contract with America, one of the first two or three bills passed that year was Congress must abide by all the laws passed for anyone else. I have been paying into Social Security since I have been in Congress and for many years before that. In fact, I'm on Social Security. <laughs> it just tells you I'm old. <laughs> I, I'm on Medicare. We've paid into this all our lives. Uh, we, we notice some people avoid paying their taxes. And we think that they should probably not be just thrown out of Congress. They should probably be thrown into jail. Yeah. But it is a, it's, it's surprising how few additional choices we have. I, we've been paying in just like you have. We have a retirement program that we pay into just like you all did at work. We pay into it over a period of time, and we get some when we retire. I will tell you how many people are in congressional retirement. About 430 in the world. Most people stay in so long they die before they get any of it. Uh, it it's, don't believe that stuff on the internet. You want to in the contract with America in 1995 uh, the term limits was the tenth item on the ten issues in the contract. I was the one who was responsible for it, prepared it, uh, educated folks on it, did talk radio on it, and it failed because it required a two-thirds vote, a positive vote in both the House and the Senate. In both cases, 80 percent of the Republicans voted yes and 80 percent of the Democrats voted no. We didn't have enough votes on it. Um, we certainly are not going to bring it up or, or have a chance to bring it up now. Um, Tom has been doing a lot of speaking. I've been on talk radio. I was talking to folks in San Antonio today. I, talk, I was on Neil Boards for half an hour a week ago. You just keep going, but you folks don't hear all this stuff. You just don't hear all this stuff. And uh, you just keep plugging away. Um, in due course, we're going to win this because the American people have, have had enough and they're going to make a change. The HSAs, they will be illegal under the new 3200 because they don't provide that coverage for oil changes. Pet smears, prostate screens, they, they let you do that and then they take on the real insurance obligation of the catastrophic issues. And under this plan, there will be a minimum benefit package and since they don't want to do that, they're not built that way, they'll be outlawed. If you have a private insurer that wants to stay outside of the government exchange and just keep his private group that likes the, their insurance company and they like them, uh, they'll, they'll be able to continue. 
Unfortunately, they won't be able to sign up any new people after 2013. And their pool will get older and sicker, and they'll be out of business. The whole purpose of this is to drive the insurance companies out of business. Mm -hmm. And we're, we trust, do you have a one minute close? Mm -hmm. Go, guys. Please. Um, I'm just, does anybody here remember Ronald Reagan? <laughs> um, the nightfall was dark when he became president. We had 20% interest rates, 21% prime rates. We had 17% home mortgages. We had 17% home mortgages, 20% interest rate, 14% inflation, 10% unemployment. And Ronald Reagan said, we can do this because we are Americans. Over the next 10 years, you and your neighbors, look around you, not government, not Reagan, you and your neighbors created 4 million new businesses and 20 million new jobs. You increased your contributions to the government voluntarily from $519 billion in 1980 to over a trillion dollars in 1988. You increase your contributions to charities. People you never knew, people you never met, from $43 billion in 1980 to $48 billion, or $88 billion in 1988. Now, I believe that was the American generation and the American century. I believe you weren't all cheating on your tax returns. I don't believe the 1980s was, was a decade of greed, as Ms. Clint said. I think she thought you were all tra uh, trading cattle futures. Most of us weren't. We're teaching school and coaching Little League and leading Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. That is America, where ordinary people do extraordinary things. And given the opportunities to do that again, you will do it. And when you do, my grandsons, Thomas, and John and Matthew and Philip will say thank you, as will I. Thank you.